is Reefer Madness, the podcast with Trevor and Kirk. Kirk, we're back. Hey, Trevor. So how's uh, it going? Good. Uh, have haven't seen you in person in a little while. You were you were up north for a bit. Well, actually, you and Doris came walking by my house a couple uh, about a week ago and dropped off those um, gummy bears. Yes, gummy stars in this case, but yes. We, gummy we, stars. Yeah, uh, for those of you who haven't seen our Reefer Mendes Makes Gummies, um, it's on the YouTube channel and we made some gummies. And they turned out really well. They turned out good. I, um, I was removing the snow from my sexy roof, from our solar panels that we got from our early sponsor, Evolve Green, way back when. People who listened to our early episodes will remember Evolve Green. I was cleaning off some snow. You guys walked by. You handed me the, the gummy stars, and I decided, why not try one? And so, what, what did you think? Well, about an hour, about an hour later, I was quite happy, and I ended up, uh, ended up cleaning actually. Um, yeah, well, we had grandchildren over, so I played with my grandchildren a little bit. That was fun. But what happened afterwards is that after about five days of being a grandparent and re reminding myself what it was like to have pre preschoolers in the house, um, they left. And then I, I, I had a second gummy about a week later and basically cleaned up the whole house like we all the stuffy bears went into the bags all the toys went into the boxes we dusted the uh, dusted and the, the Roomba went around and cleaned and we washed the floors and got our house back into order went for a walk came home and went that was a nice afternoon so it was a 30 milligram afternoon about four three four hours of uh work it's interesting because for me i find it i find an opportunity to, to do something whereas you find an opportunity to find a pillow yes yes i am a i'm a if i'm going to take something with high thc and to be honest 30 milligrams is too much for me so i took about half uh yeah it's a yeah end end of the evening thing you know and like you said about an hour later um i'm ready for a nap so that works just fine for me so no, i um yeah, going but, to these guys. But but we have an actual episode to talk about. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> while you were up north, um, got a couple interviews in. Uh, got one in with Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Um, really enjoyed this one. And he was recommended to us from Mackie from High on Homegrown, which was kind of cool. Got us in touch. Um, so, a fantastic interview, really intelligent man, and we'll get into it. And, and, you know, another one of these guys that has more cannabis knowledge in his little finger than most people you run into. So just, just like real quick things. So he's, he's a Harvard-trained doc. He is, he's a primary care, so he look, looks act after people out in, the, out in the real world. He's an internist at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and not, he's not just trained at Harvard, he is now an instructor in Harvard Medical School. Um, and, and it's not just him, and he, cannabis is a big part of what he does. Um, his dad was actually a psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry who thought cannabis was evil until he started doing some research and found it really wasn't. And he wrote a seminal book. The dad, Lester Grinspoon, uh, wrote a seminal book called Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971. And that's still considered sort of a seminal book on why marijuana should be legalized. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of cannabis knowledge in in Dr. Grinspoon, Dr. Grinspoon Sr. and Jr. Yeah, well, multi-generational, right? I, 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 I love the fact that, you know, Harvard trained, I mean, Harvard trained, and he's a cannabis physician. And, and what he was talking about, about how he uses Canada, can, cannabis and his five, his five points. Again, we'll, we'll let him tell most of his story, but some of just the really exciting stuff. Okay, so pre-pharmacy, I was in physics. I thought that that's what I was going to do, and I've always been a bit of a space nerd. Um, there's pictures of Peter Grinspoon sitting on Carl Sagan's lap, learning how to read. That just blew my mind. Blew my mind even more that Carl Sagan was smoking pot with uh, Lester Grinspoon, Peter's dad, and having, you know, really deep conversations. And uh, 
Peter Grinspoon, we interviewed, uh, talked about, well, they always talk about uh, a motivational syndrome. You know, yeah. if people smoke too much pot, you know, the, the typical stoner who doesn't do anything, right? Right. He said, no, that I saw, and it wasn't just Carl Sagan, lots of other Harvard profs and other luminaries, smart people were coming over, visit Lester, smoke a joint in the living room and have really deep discussions. So these were not a motivational. This, this is the type AAA personality who goes out and gets the stuff done. Yeah. We're getting more stuff done, arguably, after a joint. Yeah, this this guy's offering multi-generational understanding of cannabis. And I really like that 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 component because, again, I mean, I've often said that my experience with cannabis is, is over 40 years of, of being a recreational user and learning now how to be a medicinal user of cannabis and, and medicating mindfully. But what he what he has said is he made some comments that, you know, through my experience in the 70s, 80s and 90s and, you know, the propaganda that, that medical literature has thrown out at us. And I've always sat in the back of the room going, interesting, I, I don't I don't experience that. Like when I when I consume large quantities of cannabis or THC, 30 milligrams, I don't think about going to sleep. I go look in the I look to go for a run back in the day when I used to run marathons. I'd go for a run. I'd have a hoot and go for a run. It's interesting now. There's lots of marathoners that are talking about it. Back in the 90s, I would have a hoot and go for a run. I helped it help with my muscles. I didn't have any of the science at that time. It was just what I knew about cannabis and what it did for me. So it's interesting to listen to these guys. Harvard, Harvard trained doctor saying things that that I kind of intuitively understood back in the day when I was ignorant to cannabis, you know, what's all the big deal? Well, another thing I liked, and we'll, we'll honestly, we'll let him talk, but um, being Harvard trained and an internist, and I know I say this every once in a while when we talk to internists, but internists are the doctor's doctors. Internists are the, if I don't see evidence, the sky isn't blue kind of guys. And, and Dr. Grinspoon is still one of them. Like as much as he is pro cannabis, um, he doesn't want to do anything without the evidence. Like he, he thinks anecdotally that getting people off of opioids with cannabis, and he talks about this some more, I don't want to give too much away, but he's not ready to say everybody should do that tomorrow because in his mind, the evidence is still much better for like the methadone suboxone than, than the cannabinoid. So he's still... He's still cautious not to get ahead of the science is what I'm trying to say. He's not, he's, and he's not, he's not just uh, cannabis is good for everything. You know, he's cannabis is good for a lot of things, but you know, he doesn't want to get too far ahead of the science either. Well, but, but, and, and this is the, like, <laughs> I'm going to have some fun with you, Trevor, but what you did capture <laughs> in your interview yes. <laughs> is that he, like, the, the, five, the five points he makes, and I want people to really pay attention to those. One of the first things he said in, in his five points was that you can't hold pain medication from someone. Back again in the 80s, when I was starting off as a nurse and doing paramedicine and, and working on ambulance and discussing if paramedics should have analgesics on ambulances or not, the big debate was if someone has pain, the human should not have to live with pain, right? That was the big thing. So doctors had the pain scale. I can even remember being at this conference with our medical director and the owner of the ambulance and he was the owner of the ambulance is about 10 years on me so he would have been i think in those days he was in his late 40s i would have been in my early late 30s and he came up to the doctor after this after the presentation and said you know what that presentation said is that i have the right not to live with pain so from i can remember from that point forward and again in practice how the pain scale how people were always given injections for pain people weren't expected to live with pain so we and he's saying here uh peter um dr grinspoon is basically saying that people have the right to have medications but should it be opiates should should opiates be the first choice and i like how he says that you know with chronic opiate therapy you might be able to augment it with cannabis and the results that he's had People with, you know, chronic pain, cannabis can be used instead of opiates. If, you know, if it's a chronic pain, you don't maybe need all that opiates. And what he's finding is that if you do give people 
cannabis with their opiates, they're using less opiates. Um, now, without getting too far ahead, you've also done another interview, which we're going to talk about, where that also comes out in the, re in the, um, in the research that they're finding that actually uh, not just clinical observations, but actual clinical research is su suggesting the same thing, that cannabis, cannabis can be used in conjunction with opiates. So it's something that doctors... Oh yeah, opioid sparing. And, and the other thing, since we're, and he'll talk about it more, but just it's worth mentioning because people go, ah, you know, doctors, what do they know about opioid addiction? So if you're one of those, Dr. Grinspoon's again your man because Unfortunately, it's very common in healthcare in general. Uh, we, it's not talked about much, but addictions in the in the healthcare professions. We raised it. We raised fairly, it. One less it's, nurse. Yeah, it, it's fairly common. And Dr. Grinspoon is openly saying that was him too. He he literally has a book, uh, free refills. A doctor confronts his addiction. So Dr. Grinspoon, no knows from first-hand experience about uh, opioid addiction and what it takes to to treat it and then knows all sort of the the medical stuff around it as well so again could couldn't be a better guy to to talk to it than than dr Grinsburg. and and again he brings in the science here and the whole the whole science of the methadone program one of the you and i have discussed this before and and i, I don't remember who who actually gave me the definition it could have been the conversation you and i you and i had but i always always you know in the north, we have the methadone program, uh, not methadone, the... Uh, uh, the Suboxone. Yeah, it's a Suboxone program, where people come and I have to observe them and I give them, they have a locked box and they go away with the locked box. Uh, but I always thought, you know, we're just transferring the addictions from the opiate to this, this minor opiate, you know, the Suboxone. Uh, but again, what, was, what I was taught is that because people are able to get some relief with the Suboxone, we can harm reduction, put them on a, on a milder opiate, the, the Suboxone, and keep them away from the opiates that will kill them. What he's saying is that he doesn't necessarily know yet how opiates, how, how cannabis can help there, but he is saying that there might be an opportunity for that. And I think there's the research coming. I think that's number five on his list. Yes. How about we'll let, how about we'll let Grinspoon do his thing and then we'll come back and sure. and we'll talk about uh, talk about his list. Okay. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, slightly dis disjointed interview. Sorry, Dr. Grinspoon, it really was a good talk. Uh, Dr. Grinspoon, usually I start by asking people about, you know, how they got interested in cannabis. But I'm going to start a little further back. I'm going to start with your dad, Lester. Um, he was uh, sort of a pioneer after not loving cannabis. He was sort of a pioneer in the cannabis world. Can you tell me a little bit about him? Yeah, unfortunately, he passed away about four months ago this summer. But he was a, a giant in the cannabis field. He um, initially was anti-cannabis, as many psychiatrists were back then and unfortunately are today until he um, did a deep dive into the literature, um, partially because he uh, had a disagreement with a friend of his and partially because he was gonna write a book about it. And when he did a deep dive into the literature, the, the scale sort of fell from his eyes and he realized that most of the research was just um, dedicated to finding harms uh, supported by the US government. And that when you really looked at it, there wasn't um, much, it was a house of cards upon which the whole um, argument for making it illegal uh, for prohibition and that cannabis, if you look at the big picture, was had been used for thousands of years safely as a medicine and um, was relatively non-toxic. And what really impressed him was that the, the harms of prohibition were so much more than the harms of actually using cannabis that he wrote his book 19, in 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered, uh, you know, it was very well received. It was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review, and it came out very strongly in favor of legalization. At that point uh, in the United States, uh, support for legalization uh, was about 12%. And I think in part, at least due to my dad's steadfast advocacy for 50 years, now the support for legalization is about 67%. So uh, he literally has been involved for about 50 years in the legalization movement. And because of that, I've been involved in this issue my entire life. Thank you. And uh, that 
goes nicely into the uh, Mackie from High on Homegrown said, I should really ask you about uh, P- uh, about uh, uh, Carl Sagan being involved in teaching you to read. Um, is, is, that, is that true? Yeah, if you pick up a copy of my memoir, Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction, because I'm in recovery from opiate addiction, I talk a lot about growing up with Carl Sagan in my living room and this perpetual cloud of marijuana smoke. But it, um, you know, he and my dad were always having these, oh, and there's a picture in my Twitter profile of me sitting on Carl Sagan's lap and him teaching me to read. I always joke about how I was teaching him to read, <laughs> but in actuality, he was teaching me to read, but, uh, cause I was only about two or three. But um, the fact is, you know, that's a great example of like, you know, as I was growing up in school, they'd be teaching us all this bullshit about cannabis, like it causes a motivational syndrome. And then at home, like you would not believe the luminaries that would be like sharing a joint with my dad and having these like brilliant discussions and like it doesn't cause a motivational syndrome and that's a perfect example of like how I learned at an early age that it was all propaganda and none of it was true and I learned first of all to think for myself second of all that you know cannabis is not what they're telling us it is and third of all that you know you just have to um You just have to figure these things out um, on your own because there's so many different agendas when it comes to something like this. And when, by the time I started medical school, I felt very immune to a lot of the drug war propaganda that unfortunately made up our curriculum in medical school about, about cannabis. Thank you. So we fast forward through medical school and now you're out on the other side. Now you, you, you had mentioned your, your book about opioid addiction. Now we, we, opioid addiction and cannabis comes up on our podcast actually quite a bit. Now I know it's an enormous topic, but uh, can you tell us a few uh, sort of a a summary of an enormous topic about uh, cannabis and helping people get off of opioids? Absolutely. I consider there to be five different ways in which cannabis could uh, help people get off opiates. Um, only one of which is controversial. Well, I mean, they're all controversial, but only one of which I consider controversial. I mean, first of all, you can transition people who are on chronic opiate therapy off of opiates onto cannabis. This has to be voluntary. Um, you shouldn't be taking opiates away from anybody. You know, people have a right to pain medication and to stay in the opiates if that's what they prefer. But, you know, I find the quality of life is much better on cannabis for the people who do make the transition. And it, it's, in, it's inarguably is much safer. So that's number one. Number two, I start new chronic pain patients on cannabis instead of opiates because it's as effective and much safer. So that decreases the people who are at risk from opiates. Um, if the chronic pain is very severe, you might need opiates because opiates are stronger than cannabis, but for the mild to moderate chronic pain that, for example, many Americans who are getting more rotund, older, and arthritic are suffering from. Uh, I, I can't relate to any of those. For that. <laughs> Neither can I. Um, the third thing is you can lower the dose of opiates using cannabis because they work on the same receptors. And studies have shown you could lower the dose of opiates um, by about 80%. And that's really important because a lot of the trouble you get into the opiates in terms of overdoses and dependency and uh, constipation and mental status changes happens to be dose related. So if you could lower the dose of opiates by up to 80%, that's a big win. Number four, and I could vouch for this both from personal experience and from the studies that are out there is that cannabis is probably the best drug for opiate withdrawal syndromes. And I know we were talking before you mentioned you had heard of that as well in your, your clinical experience. And, um, you know, that's a really big deal if it keeps people, retains people in treatment. And the only one that's controversial is whether cannabis can serve the same function as methadone and buprenorphine as a medication for opiate use disorder, as substitution treatment for opiate use disorder. Now, I know of thousands of patients that have told me of their successful use of cannabis to transition out of their opiate addiction and consider uh, cannabis a gateway drug out of addiction. Yet at the same time, um, there's hardcore evidence that buprenorphine and methadone lead to a 50 to 80% reduction in overdoses and deaths um, when people who are suffering from opiate use disorder. And we don't have that data yet for cannabis. It needs to be studied 
And I wouldn't be surprised if we found that. However, we don't have that data yet. So given that we have the data for buprenorphine and methadone and don't have the data for cannabis, it just doesn't seem right to recommend a treatment when it's life or death, where we don't have data, when we could be recommending a treatment where we do have the data. Again, if I treat your migraine with medical cannabis and it doesn't work, you get a migraine, not the end of the world. But if I treat your opiate use disorder and it doesn't work, you could overdose or die. So it's better to stick until we have the data to um, the proven the proven treatments. So again, I think in four of the ways I mentioned, absolutely helpful um, to lessen our dependence on opiates, which will um, thus uh, help with the opiate crisis. But the fifth one is still a work in progress. I also think that um, the novel cannabinoids that we're just starting to learn about, you know, the CBGs, the THC8s, or the Delta ATCs, the CBNs, the CBCs, the THCV, which can control weight loss, blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, um, potentially uh, help us with this epidemic of uh, obesity and diabetes, which I see every day as a primary care physician. I think these things are just profoundly exciting. You know, I have some concern that like with CBD, the enthusiasm in the marketing is gonna soar high above the actual science. So we have to keep an eye on that. But I think there's this such, such untapped, unbelievable, unlimited potential for us to exploit the endocannabinoid system and all of these cannabinoids for health purposes and wellness purposes. Again, I mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. This is an incredible, incredibly exciting time to be involved in this field. And like every day I wake up and I'm like, wow, what am I going to read about today? It's really fun. Thank you, Dr. Goodspoon. So I know this has been a bit of a disjointed interview, but I'll, I'll wrap up by asking, was there, was there anything else you, you wished I'd asked and anything else you, you think our listeners really need to know about cannabis medicinally or otherwise? Well, just that, um, you know, just like any medication, there's no free lunch. Like there are risks. Um, people have to be aware that like, we don't know the safety in pregnancy or breastfeeding. So it probably should be avoided unless there are no other options. That's true for a lot of medications. As a primary care doctor, I'm really cautious about any medication okay. in pregnancy or, or breastfeeding. Cannabis not excluded. You know, people have to be careful with driving. Teens shouldn't be using it. Um, and it just, the way I look at it is that the reason cannabis is so safe is that it's safer than whatever else we'd be using. I mean, Think of what else we'd be using for insomnia, you know, Ambien or, you know, some tricyclic or uh, some other sedative like a benzodiazepine. I mean, of course, cannabis is safer than those. Or what else right. we'll be using for pain? Uh, certainly it's safer than opiates. And then you look at non-steroidals. I mean, if they don't give you an ulcer or a heart attack, they're going to kill your kidneys. I have so many patients yeah. in their 60s or 70s whose kidneys are slowly dying. This is all preventable if they've been using a little bit of cannabis tincture all along, they wouldn't be having renal insufficiency. So I just think that it's important that people keep cannabis in context. And I don't like how cannabis advocates um, dismissively, dismissive, uh, reflexively dismiss any and all harms about cannabis because it does have harms, but you've got to keep it in context. It, there's no free lunch with any medication, but it does appear safer than the alternative. So just encourage people to keep it all in perspective. So, Trevor, there's no free lunch, man. Yes. There's no free lunch. Uh, no, no, no. Um, and, and I really like his saying that because with all the amazing things that cannabis does, and, you know, I get more convinced the more we learn about this, it is easy to forget. It's not good for everything all the time, and it's still a medication, and we still sort of have to treat it with respect. Yes, yes, and, and, and again, we, we are kind of positive on this, on this program because we've seen a lot of positive things that come from cannabis, but it goes right back to our first episode, Why Worry? There are there are things to consider about cannabis. It is a drug. It is something that, you know, 9%, if not less, people can be addicted to it. There are syndromes that come from it. So, and we don't know a lot about pregnancy and breastfeeding. Now, we've done two series on, on uh, prenatal consumption of cannabis, and, and, I've, and I took an uh, executive links program on it. And again, 
people speak. How did that go, Kirk? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> it was a good it was good to take education from other people. But as you and I have said, we've researched Canada cannabis in such a way that we see the harm reduction it can have. Now, I'm not saying that people like we don't know how cannabis works with pregnancy, but we do know that how we have reacted to people, who, women who have used cannabis in pregnancy, how we've reacted to them has, has also not been positive. So, yeah, that's one of the big takeaways. I, people should go back and listen to your, I think we have two or two, three two now on, it, yeah. on cannabis. And pr- uh, but yeah, that, that was the big, one of the biggest takeaway I took from both of our experts on that is the biggest harm is you do a drug test after a woman delivers find some cannabis uh, uh, metabolites in their system and take, take the baby yeah. away. So that's not harm reduction. <laughs> well, well, no, it's not because the deed's been done and, the, and if damage is going to happen, you know, the damage would have happened already. But but yeah, so I, I agree with I agree with what he's saying is that there's no free lunch. We have to remember that cannabis is a drug uh, and we have to respect that. But one thing I will always say about cannabis is that although it is a drug, one thing that we do know is that from a harm reduction perspective, it's not going to kill you like opiates will or other benzos will, where you can actually do yourself some serious harm. I mean, people don't realize one of the one of the worst drugs out there is Tylenol, right? I mean, yeah, Tylenol, what is four grams a day, man, is max. You take anything other than that, you, you hit your liver gets a hit. And and so, you know, if Tylenol or aspirin, if aspirin was to be legalized again, would would they allow it? So uh, it, it, aspirin absolutely would not be an over the counter medication. And not that I'm telling this as a how to manual. So just but uh, they always use Tylenol in our toxicology course as a kind of a an interesting one, because, again, not a how to just a for your information. If you're going to try to take your own life, Tylenol is the way to do it. Because you're not, if you overdose on it, and you're going to tell me we're going to cut this out later, and we might, but if you overdose on the Tylenol, you don't feel any pain. Like you, 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 you just, you don't notice it when you start having uh, symptoms of uh, liver failure. It's all, it might be too late already. Whereas if you overdose on on aspirin, uh, you, you feel sick right away. You probably end up feeling sick enough that you call someone and say, I feel terrible, take me to the hospital. Where with the Tylenol overdose, they tend to end up, by the time they need to say, I got to go to the hospital, it might be too late already. Uh, I don't, I don't and, think we should cut this at all. Yeah. I, I, I deal with a Tylenol overdose, gosh, when I'm up north, I, I deal with them a lot. Uh, two or three a rotation. It's it's a common drug to overdose. And what I keep reminding my what I keep reminding my patients about is that I don't recommend it because you can take it and there's drama and we do all the things to get you to city and we you know we flush it out with knack and we, we do all the right thing. But if you don't come in within a specific timeline and you do damage your liver, there ain't no going back. You die slowly over a period of four or five days to a week, and there is nothing we can do. So there may no, there may not be any pain, but you lay in a bed with a destroyed liver, and you die slowly. So it, I would suggest it's a horrible way to kill yourself. Um, I'd rather have a bale of cannabis land on me from an airplane <laughs> and do it suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get too to more of it, <laughs> <laughs> um, but opioids, yes. I think it because you, you, I, I, I deal with people who are on Suboxone and Methadone, you yeah. do as well. Yeah. So we're not, I'm not saying we're experts, but it comes up in our practice. But I think one of the, because it, I know it sounds silly, but it sort of surprised me when I started doing it. I think it was surprised, you know, people hear about opioid crisis. Well, the biggest, well, there's lots of problems with opioids, but one of the problems is, you know, you've recognized you have an issue, you've you went to seek help, you're, you know, you're diagnosed, you've got an opioid use disorder, and you end up on a Suboxone program. Um, it, even one of the things that surprised me is even when things are going well, you know, you've been on, you've been stabilized, it's six months, it's a year, thing, things are going okay. And you decide to sort of wean yourself off, you know, maybe against medical advice, maybe not, but you feel good. I, you know, I, I'm good. I'm good. And so, you know, you, you 
you stop taking the Suboxone, and then something happens, your boyfriend, girlfriend breaks up with you, you lose it, whatever, you know, some trigger, relatively, some trigger. something pops, pops up in your life, a trigger, and then you go back to the street drugs that you used to take to sort of help you deal with that pain. That's a really common time to have an overdose because you didn't realize that, you know, we brought your tolerance way down and what you used to be able to do a year ago will kill you now. Like it's just, it's so insidious how, how easy it is to die from, opiates. from take, uh, from unintentionally taking yeah. more opioids than you thought yeah, you were going to. The other, the other problem I have with the, with the Suboxone program, and again, my limited experience with it, cause I, I'm not as, I don't do it daily, uh, but I, I do deal with it depending on the community I'm in, we do deal with it. But I, I and I've had these conversations with them cause I purposely, w I want to know what's the plan of getting you off this? And 100% of the patients have said to me, plan to get me off of this? I don't know of any plan to get me off of this. Well, that's because it, this is harm reduction. The idea is it is safer for you to be on Suboxone for the rest yes. of your life <laughs> than to get a possibly tainted supply of opioids from yes. somewhere. So, so essentially, so like you've said, you, you, you go from one drug. I think, I, think, I think we've only known one person who kicked it and he cold turkey and basically went through a week and a half of hell and as far as I know is not on the Suboxone program or as far as I know isn't on any opiates. Um, so yeah, the, our, our, our mutual acquaintance, yes. yes. As far as I know, that's going well. And yeah, um, and I, we don't have a huge number of Suboxone slash methadone people and not a lot end up off of opioids. Um, you know, we've had some going off the program and come back on and some on very low doses for, you know, and they're, they're functional members of society, jobs and, you know, spouses and kids and all that. So I, I, I consider that a success when, you know, they're at a low dose and, you know, continuing on with well, life. I but, but yeah, but, but you're right. That is the most common question you get at the beginning from sort of new pharmacists, new techs, new people who are suddenly getting up to speed on the, on the, the opioid replacement therapy is, okay, so when do we get them off of it? The answer is maybe never. Well, again, this is now in the 60 odd episodes that we've had, uh, we are learning over and over and over again that cannabis can play a role in the opioid overdose and the opioid crisis we're having in Canada. And here's another gentleman that not only has lived experience, but as a Harvard graduate, Harvard professor, who's preaching, preaching the benefits of cannabis. Uh, I don't know, Trevor, I think there's, I think that I think I think doctors, family physicians need to start listening to Reefer Madness, the podcast and learning how cannabis can help. Uh, they can. And at your encouragement, I think we're going to turn this one into a little bit of a mini series. We've got at least one more episode coming up with uh, someone who's so Dr. Grinspoon was definitely on the clinical end, you know, the one on one patient end. And lots of good stuff from there. Uh, we've got one episode coming up for sure on more of the researcher end. And I've got one, a guy I'm chasing who there might actually be some guidelines out there for oh, how nice. to get people off of opioids and put them up with cannabis. But I haven't got okay. that one yet, but I for sure got the, I've got the researcher in the can. Yeah. I, I think we'll, we'll have a little opi opioid and uh, cannabis mini series I think that's a good on. idea, Trevor. So, uh, Kirk Nyquist, I'm the nurse. Reefer Madness, the podcast. Tre <laughs> Trevor Schufeld, I'm the pharmacist. Uh, remember to come back. <laughs>